Hey, deserving listeners, today we, we are going to talk about record keeping. So for you clinicians out there, this will be relevant to you. To you non-clinicians, I don't know if this will be interesting to you, but some of you like to listen to this sort of stuff, so we'll see. We have a special guest on the podcast today to talk about record keeping. Please introduce yourself to podcast land, Francis. Hi, my name is Francis Shopik. I am trained as a counselor as well as an uh, attorney, although today I'm here to speak as on educate these issues for educational purposes. Yeah. So Fran, right at the beginning, is there anything that you want to plug where people can find you because your service is very important and needed by a lot of clinicians. So how can people find you online? Thanks, Kirk. Well, I have a website. It's francisshopick.com. That's F-R-A-N-C-E-S-S-C-H-O-P-I-C-K.com. I personally can be reached at F-S, my, my two initials, F-S at francisshopick.com. Um, also, I just want to say my, to give an idea of my background, that I am an attorney with an extensive background in social work, both private practice as well as agency practice, uh, psychology, and psychiatric research, where I've been on the faculties of two major medical schools on the East Coast. Um, and um, I work, my, my main work is, as, as an attorney, I work with counselors and DOH, D Department of Health licensees, who have complaints against them. I, I represent them in that complaint process, which is really important. Um, I, personally, I think it's a, a, nobody should ever try to represent themselves in a DOH process. I also do risk management talks on such things as record keeping, documentation, um, subpoenas, how to handle a subpoena, how to testify in a court or at a deposition, um, understanding family law and how that interfaces with counseling scope of practice so that you so that counselors don't act outside their scope of practice and understand how to handle those things. I just also want to say that anything that we talk about here today is just to give a disclaimer that um, I'm not giving legal advice. I'm not giving any kind of uh, representation. People should not confuse this with, with representation, legal advice, uh, consultation, supervision, any of that, if they want to speak to me, they're welcome to call me at 425-891-3411 or to email me. I do consultations at no cost. And um, and I think this is a great service that you're providing, so I'm happy to be here. So what are some of the problems that you see us therapists? You're a lawyer. You probably see all sorts of things that us therapists do, that counselors that are you roll your eyes at, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, what are some of the common things that you see us do that you wish you could just say, hey, stop doing that? Well, the first thing I think is that I think um, counselors often don't like record keeping, which I understand. They see it as annoying and, and burdensome and laborious. But what I try to get people to understand is that it's actually an opportunity for you to create a body of evidence that can be protective of you down the line. So I guess the, the thing that I see most commonly is that people avoid doing the record keeping. They do a poor job at doing the record keeping and that they're in fact squandering an opportunity to protect themselves. Yeah. So music to my ears, I, I was as a supervisor, cause I've, I've as you know, 20 plus years as a therapist myself, uh -huh. I, I've gone through the different progression and later in my career, finally kind of arrived to that place of, I actually enjoy taking notes because I sleep better at night. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Knowing that <laughs> if anything happens, which is rare, but mm -hmm. if it did, uh, I will gladly hand over my file and not have any or have very little worries, you know, in terms of uh, making sure that the uh, the file is, that it looks competent and to the standard of practice, but also make sure that the things that come up, like, for example, if someone was thinking about suicide and then they attempted or, God forbid, even completed right. and the file is pulled, I know that I will have had a uh, record that I did my responsibility. Um, but the thing that I find as a supervisor for trainees and even uh, post-grad, you know, recently graduated uh, supervisees of mine they haven't been trained enough, so they're yeah. terrified. Right. They bump up against this, you know, they, uh, you and me saying, make sure your file's looking good, you know, you, know, you, should, you should enjoy taking your notes. And 
and then they're like, okay. And then they, they sit down to do it. And they're, and I think this, this voice creeps in there of just like, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you sound like an idiot when you, you write your notes or something, something gets in the way. And then they just like, well, I'll do it later or something. Do you find that to be true? Yeah. A big problem that people, a big question that people have is that they always want to know how much to write and what to write. And I think that that's what keeps them from fulfilling the task because they're concerned from the start. How much do I do? What do I do? There are two schools of thought. One is that, I'm sure you've heard this, one is that people will say, um, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen, which leads to copious notes where people feel that they're almost writing a journal on the event. And then other people say, silence is golden. You know, just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. Because, and it's true, in a legal setting, it, if you say too much, it could hang you. You're, it's like you're providing the rope to hang yourself. So um, I basically feel like it, it's a middle ground. On the one hand, you absolutely, by law and ethics uh, and clinical needs, you absolutely need to have a note. You cannot have a session, even if the, the client asks not to, you can't have a session that has no note unless there's some, you know, maybe the military might have particular rules around that. Um, but in general, you must have a note. So that's clear. Then the question becomes, what should be in it? I would say in general, you really just have to have a note. All that the law says, the WAC in the state of Washington says, is that you have to have a note in addition to certain other bits of material uh, that is sufficient to support responsible clinical practice of the type that you provide. But the question becomes, what's sufficient and what's responsible and what, ki what is your clinical practice? Because some people use, a, they're eclectic, they use a lot of different things. Um, but if you begin to understand that if there's no, if there's no crisis, a soap note is perfectly adequate, you know, s subjective, objective assessment and, and uh, plan. And it can be one line for each piece. Um, but, but if, as you just mentioned, if there's some threat of suicidality, harm to self or others, abuse of a child, adult, elderly person, a dependent person, th that's where you go to town. That's where you need to put um, really, you know, you, you need to do a risk assessment, liability assessment. Um, you need to ask certain questions that are very important, and you need to provide a rationale for what you did or didn't do. If you decide to make a call, if you decide not to make a call, you want to provide a rationale for that. And then you've covered yourself. Yeah, and I think a big part of it for me was learning real examples of when people are uh, successfully sued or their license is sanctioned in some way because of something that they did that was related to their notes. And learning from that, I then learned, oh, these set, because uh, when you're just starting out, uh, like you said, people tend to write uh, journals, uh, yeah. you know, pages and pages. I did this too. I remember uh -huh. back in the day in the, in the 90s, there, were, there weren't computers at agencies, and so we hand wrote our notes. And mm -hmm. I remember handwriting uh, two pages mm -hmm. of notes for one session. Mm -hmm. And because one, I think I was told that I needed to, uh, if, it, if you didn't document, it didn't happen. But also I felt like I needed to justify what I was doing to mm -hmm. everyone. And my supervisor immediately said, you're gonna have 20, 30 sessions a week I need to sign all these notes. I don't have time to read all. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you only need like one or two sentences here. You know, please yeah. reduce it. Anyway, um, so I, I think that um, learning about the kinds of things that can happen to us, and then we work ourselves backwards to figuring out um, the kinds of, uh, obviously our notes are also to help us with treatment, right? That's the main yeah. purpose. But another purpose is to make sure that we're, um, covering our liability. And so uh, what sort of end result situations do you see as a lawyer uh, that compel us to make sure that our notes are good leading up to that? Right. So good question. Um, so there are two, generally speaking, there are two types of actions that can occur. One is to be sued. That's a, liab that's a liability claim or a lawsuit. And that goes through the judicial system. That would go through the superior court. That's where someone says that you had an obligation, a duty to me, you breached that duty. Only because you breached that duty did I have a problem and or did you do damage, did I experience this damage and then I can show what the damages were. Um, so that's a lawsuit. A, but what's more likely to happen is, uh, as you also mentioned, is a, is a complaint against your license. 
And that goes through the administrative law system. That goes through the Department of Health. That's much more likely to occur for several reasons. The main points being that if a person, well, the main points being that, first of all, for a person to file a lawsuit, um, they actually have to have had a relationship with you. You have to have had a duty to them, you have a responsibility to them. Um, so that narrows down the field. And then also they'd have to show damages. They'd have to call, have what's called a good case, right? So if they go to a lawyer, the lawyer's going to say, well, what's the case? And, and is it a good case? And um, what's the likelihood of winning? And there's going to be a lot of investigation involved, that sort of thing. So that in that case of a lawsuit, even if you wanted to file a lawsuit, the lawyer would probably say to you, let's first file with the Department of Health. Because if they have a finding against you, then that will help our case. That will lay a foundation for our case. Also, the Department of Health will do an investigation, which will be at no cost to you. It'll be done by the Department of Health. So that's another reason it's more likely to have it, um, to have, it's, it's more likely that if you were to file a lawsuit, you'd first do the Department of Health complaint. Also, the Department of Health complaint can be filed by anybody. So you could be, a person could be standing in the supermarket in the checkout line and overhear somebody else talk about you as a therapist and they could say, I'm going to file a complaint. I, you know, I, even though the person who goes to you, your actual client loves you and thinks that what you did was creative and wonderful, the person in the stu- supermarket line might disagree and they could file a complaint. If the complaint sounds like if true, it would pose, pose a risk to the public, the Department of Health is likely to look into it because they're, about, they're all about uh, protecting the public. So that's, so that's another reason that it's more likely to have the Department of Health complaint. I, I have a whole thing about insurance. I always em- encourage people to get insurance because they often think they have insurance to, to protect their license, but they don't. So that's a different talk, really. But, you know, people will say, I'll say to them, do you have insurance to protect your license? They'll say, oh, yeah, I've got lots of insurance, a million dollars. And see, that's the lawsuit thing. And you need, sometimes you need to pay extra to make sure that your um, license is covered. Yeah, I recently was aware of this and paranoid or freaked out and called my insurance people and they said I had it. It was oh, good. part of the thing. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> but yeah, I, I never knew that there was this distinction yeah. between that. I mean, because to me, yeah, right. A licensing complaint is much more likely mm-hmm. um, or at least if you are sued, then it, it'll be a component of it. And I've actually been expert witness on some of these cases uh, and found them to be extremely frustrating to the counselors involved Mm -hmm. uh, because one, it's scary to have your uh, practice scrutinized by lawyers and and other sorts of people, but also because the state sometimes has different points of view on what we're supposed to be doing than what some of us might believe to be true. Right. Well, see, that, and that's another really important point, because I find, first of all, as a group, I find counselors to be extremely responsible and ethical and caring. Almost paranoid. Like they're, well, ch- they're almost to, the, to a fault <laughs> on some level. Yeah, I, I would say anxious. They're, they're, they can be very anxious as a group, which is actually yeah. a sign of response, you know, a sense of responsibility and self-examination. They yeah. don't just blame other people. They ask, what have I done? Right. But also... There, you know, we all counselors all have a an imperative to um, to care about their clients, to care about their patients, and unconditional positive regard is one of the statements. And they often mistake that to think. I think that, that they often mistake that to to think that that means that they they have a certain assumption, for instance, that a client is always telling the truth, or that there's factually. I mean, and I think there's a difference between fact and truth. A person might be saying what's their emotional truth, but factually. Sometimes there are distortions. So, so when a client comes to a counselor and says something like, you know, my husband's a bum, my husband's an alcoholic bum, he never plays with the kids, and, you know, he's a bad father, the client, I mean, the uh, counselor needs to be very careful not to write down in their notes that the husband is an alcoholic bum who never plays with the kids and doesn't care and is a terrible father. You can say the client reports the husband is an alcoholic bum. You can say client reports, quote, the husband is an alcoholic bum, but you do not want to be making a statement that of, of as if it were a fact when you have absolutely no idea. So if that goes to court, so yeah. there's a custody battle, and yeah. the uh, there's and the the uh, cl- the counselor's 
file is subpoenaed or they the, the counselor is just asked to pe- testify, which sometime hap- sometimes happens. And the counselor uh, submits a report or even gets on the stand and says, yeah, uh, from my understanding, this husband is a bum and drinks too much and is a bad father. Yeah. Um, so obviously uh, not a uh, advisable action and <laughs> uh, biased and uh, not proper assessment procedure and uh, because you know, ethically you, you can't be treating someone and assessment, assess them in that way. Um, what are the consequences? Because 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 I run into this, you know, people will come to me, uh, supervisees and other people, and they'll say, "Oh, well, you know, I really love this this client of mine. You know, it's his mother, and boy, you know, her her ex husband is quite a piece of work. And you know, maybe he is. Yeah. But who knows? And mm-hmm. and you know, the counselors, therapists laying out all this case and. You know, and they're going to court and we got to keep these kids away from this father, you know, because it's just a bad thing. Again, could be true, might not be true. It's hard to know. And you feel for the kids if it is true. And they're saying, OK, well, you know, the, the mother, the, my client is asking me to submit a report. And I'm always like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and I go over the ethics and, uh, you know, the possible distortions that you're having and everything and your role as a treating counselor and therapist. But but it would help me if I had you to tell me so I could tell them what could happen to them if they actually did submit something and it was either not true or it was found to be unfounded in court. What would happen to a counselor in that situation? Well, first of all, you, you alluded to very correctly to the idea of scope of practice, um, that a, a counselor needs to understand what their role is. They need to understand who's their client, what's their role, and what's the goal of, of treatment. So, and whatever they do should be within those parameters. Um, if the person goes to court, or if the person, the counselor is asked to write a letter, often cl- clients will say, if you would just write a letter to my lawyer, it's not a legal document, or the lawyer will write something, it won't be a legal document. It's like, please, anything that you write that's for legal purposes becomes a legal document. It becomes evidence within that case. Yeah. So, no offense, but lawyers are sneaky. They can be. Well, what happens is, is that lawyers feel that they have this imperative to do everything that they need to do to, on behalf of their client. Yeah. And so sometimes in that situation, they might say to somebody, I'm here to protect my client. I'm not your lawyer. I'm just trying to get what I need for, that, for, that, um, for their client. So I personally, I'm not going to use the word sneaky, but, um, <laughs> but I um, understand that sometimes people feel misled because they feel that, that they think that the lawyer is there for them and they're actually not. And that's another piece that's important is for counselors to understand that their, counsel, their client's lawyer is not, is not acting on the counselor's behalf in part because it's not their responsibility to, but also because they, don't, they have no idea of what a counselor's responsibilities are. You know, a, a lawyer, let's say a family law lawyer, may not really understand what the counselor's parameters are and what their scope of practice is. So they really can't be there for you. And that's why it really is important for you to have somebody to talk to. Yeah, that's interesting. Lawyer. So they're probably just thinking, well, yeah, it's a witness that can speak to uh, the uh, the thing uh, on, in on trial. They have some data that will back us up. and. Right. I, the all, the impression I also get is some lawyers think that the word of a professional counselor will have a lot of weight right. compared to just the uh, account of the uh, a parent, which is kind of funny because it's like, well, the counselor is only getting their information from right. one of the parents, but somehow they think like an official... Uh, you know, counselor word will be somehow heard more. And I, is that true? I think they do sometimes think who better, who's who better to, to get an opinion from than the counselor. Yeah. The problem is, is so this now also reaches into another piece, which is the language of the court. So, so, well, there are a couple of things. So first of all, the counselor might be working with a parent as you're ex- going with your example. The counselor's working with the parent and the counselor really likes the parent and really believes that the parent is a great parent. And maybe even the child has come into the session and says, I love my mom. I don't want, I don't want to be with my dad. Maybe they've said that, but that doesn't make it true. It doesn't, you know, you don't know what the dynamic is, what dynamic is going on and you don't know, um, 
what the loyalties are. But let's say it is true. Let's say the, the husband actually does have certain problems that preclude proper parenting. That still isn't the counselor's job to make that decision or to make that distinction. So I've seen where counselors will, you, there are certain words that are terms of art. Um, so a term of art is a, is a word that has special meaning within a certain profession and within a certain context. Uh, we have that all the time, for instance, as, as, or as in a clinical setting, the word paranoid, you know, or schizophrenia. I used to work with, um, on a research project with schizophrenia, and I'm always hearing people use, misuse the term. They'll say the weather is schizophrenic. Right. Well, actually, that's not true. Um, you yeah, know, it's not even solutions. applicable. Right, right. I know, exactly. So, um, so people misuse terms. You know, we might, the, in the general public, someone might say somebody's paranoid, but when you're speaking clinically, that's got very specific meaning. So in the law, and in a context like what we're describing, such as we're describing, um, words like recommend, or an evaluation, or an opinion, those words have very special meaning. Mm. They mean, if you offer an opinion, that suggests uh, that, unless it's within the clinical context, that suggests that you are acting as an expert witness. Or if you use the word recommendation, that means that you've done a neutral evaluation and this is what you've come up with. Mm -hmm. But as a therapist, you're not even supposed to be neutral. You're not neutral. You're, the, you're there for your client and you're listening to your client's point of view. So you've put yourself in, in a dual role. You've created a kind of forensic, you, you, you start out with the therapeutic role, the clinical role, and then you, without realizing it, you create a forensic role. And then that's a dual role. So you were asking what might happen. What might happen is that somebody would um, get upset with you, such as the other parent who is, you know, who your client called an alcoholic bum, and um, they could file a DOH complaint against you. And you would have, you would have been um, guilty of unprofessional conduct insofar as you've created a dual role that caused harm. So you wouldn't be lumped in with the civil case or something, it would be a DOH complaint and a yes. license um, sanction of some sort, either removal or probation or more supervision or that kind of stuff. Right. There, the, the DOH has, um, has a schedule of things. There's tier A, tier B, tier C. You can see it online and it, it talks about what, what the qualifications are to fulfill those criteria. And then on that basis that they might have certain sanctions. Right. Interesting. Okay. So one question I have is that in a lot of people's disclosure statements, going back to the beginning of my time in the 90s when I first started to develop my own disclosure statements, was I would see this clause at the end that would say, if you sign here, you're saying you, you're, you don't want me to take any notes. You don't want me to keep any progress notes other than you know, the bare minimum, the date, the time, um, the charge, this kind of thing. And uh, a lot of counselors, if you've seen this before, will, if you have this in your disclosure statement, you, you like this because it means you don't have to do any paperwork. any Because if, you know, essentially you're asking your client, um, if you want, you can opt for an option where you ask me as the counselor to not have to take any notes because you don't want any detailed record of this uh, treatment, um, and that is your option. And then the the cat client says, "Yeah, that sounds good. I don't want a detailed record of my therapy." And they say, "Yes, please don't keep any notes." Um, is that uh, legal? In the state of Washington, you absolutely must have a note. You have to have a note. It has to include certain things, which are listed in a WAC. Um, they have to include, the, for instance, the person's name and certain identifying um, information um, down to the point, and it might include, uh, well, certain information, it's um, one of the WACs, it's WAC, I believe it's 246-809-035, I think. Um, so it's on record keeping. And What'd you say, 246? 246-809-035. Wow, what a memory on you. It's record keeping and retention, I think. Uh, yeah, you're right. My God. Um, okay, so let's look here. Uh, client name, fee arrangement, uh, dates of counseling, disclosure statement, signed and date. Okay, the uh, written request for no treatment records to be kept. Um, and uh, that looks like it's it. Wait, no, and no, up at top. Uh, fee, date, disclosure, uh, presenting problem, 
purpose of purpose or diagnosis. So presenting problem, purpose or diagnosis, notation and results from formal consults, and progress notes sufficient to support responsible, responsible clinical, clinical practice, practice for, for the, the type, type of theoretical thing. orientation therapy um, that they use. Um, so progress notes sufficient to support responsible clinical practice so that there needs to be something in there. Well, that so then if you read further down, oh, it, it says, says that the person can opt out. Uh, opt out, but they still have to have up to a certain point. Right. Uh, let's see. But it doesn't if I'm, if I'm skimming this kind of, but it doesn't look like. OK, well, let's just read it. Um, yeah, it just says those those four things, the name, the fee arrangement the date, and the disclosure statement. And the fact that they've asked not to have a... Right. Right. So so there has to be something. You cannot just have nothing there. I believe there might be some exception to that if the if there's in the military, some people make an exception. But for, for you know, what most counselors are doing, you have to have something that shows that you weren't just kind of sitting around shooting the breeze. You know okay. what I mean? That it was a... However, but there's an allowance for like extremely uh, sparse notes if yes. the client requests that. If, but that doesn't mean that you have to agree. Right. And so my cl my question as your attorney would be, why would you agree to this? Because you're basically you would be agreeing to sit in a room alone with somebody who has certain expectations of you that may or may not be realistic, who could file a complaint against you. In which case, if they did, you would have nothing to prove your version of events. Interesting. So, so why would you do that? Right. So I think the implication that people have when they see this option as counselors, they will say, oh, well, so if anything ever comes up that I need notes for, I'll just say, well, they opted out of notes. So right. I'm, I'm exempt from, this, uh, from the need to demonstrate that I did uh, uh, the standard of practice. But that's not true. No, it's not true at all. I mean, these are there are a few what I call myths about um, about record keeping, and that would be one of them. Um, some of the myths are, for instance, that people think well, you know, counselors will often put other people's needs first, as opposed to later we're going to be talking about narcissism, you know, as opposed to those people. So, but counselors will often put other need, people need, people's needs first. And so they'll think that whatever the client wants is what they should do and to protect their com the client's confidentiality without thought to the further, you know, sequelae of what could occur. Um, so some of the myths are that uh, if I don't keep note, that if the client asks not to have a note, that I shouldn't have a note. Or another myth is that if I don't keep a note and if there were a DOH complaint, I would be forgiven. You know, they could, that the DOH couldn't follow up on the complaint because I don't have notes. That's absolutely not true. If you don't have notes, you're out of luck. Right. Because they will pursue it. And, or I, I've, had, I've had situations where they did pursue it, even though the person didn't have notes. He didn't, and this hits on another myth, is that after a certain amount of time that you should destroy the notes. So this one uh, situation I'm aware of is where somebody, you know, five years had passed and it was true that they could get rid of the note. So they got rid of the notes and then more, you know, five plus years later, there was a complaint and they had nothing to support their version of events. Interesting. There's also, I've heard from some clients where they actually purposefully keep notes that they, they themselves can't even read. And they think that this insulates them from, uh, from scrutiny. Their progress notes they can't read? They cannot even read their own progress notes. <laughs> they purposefully, with purpose, they write notes that are, that are illegible thinking that that will both, on the one hand, show that they kept a note, so fulfill that criterion, but which but will not be illegible so that they will escape scrutiny. And that's so wrong, I can't, I mean, it's... Because you, so you, so this, is a, <laughs> this is a bastardization of another uh, principle that I think is actually accurate, which is that, you know, there's a difference between progress notes and psychotherapy notes, yeah. according to HIPAA. So, we're, we've been talking about progress notes up, up yes. until this point. This is the official record in the client's file that the client has access to if they want to pull their file. Yeah. We have a thing called psychotherapy notes, which are, which are our own notes. And generally speaking, they're not um, uh, pulled by clients and other legal procedures. I don't know the words for it, but they tend to just be protected by us. And we can take them at will and destroy them at will. They're just like our own notes that we look at to help us uh, provide the best treatment for the client. Essentially, HIPAA is just like, 
well, we don't want to limit clinicians to having every single note that they take available to uh, you know certain parties that have access to the file. We want people to be able to write things down. Like I might write, I wonder if this client was sexually abused growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, I might want to have that question in, in my own notes, but I don't want to have that in the file because what if the the file's pulled and it goes to a court or something? And the client doesn't want that question. And, or the details of the sexual abuse. I mean, that's probably more relevant of just or like- Or you could be wrong. The person never did have sexual abuse. It's right. just your hypothesis. Right. And or the client says, here are the details of the trauma and we write a trauma narrative together mm-hmm. and I write some, narr- some, some notes down of like step one, this happened, step two. And then, you know, the client doesn't want that in the in the official file, but I need to keep that so that we can have this repetitive, um, you know, session by session revisiting of those details that, that can be very therapeutic. So HIPAA allows for that. And sometimes I've heard people say that your psychotherapy notes, you can, if you make them illegible and they happen to be pulled, because I've actually heard of situations where the courts have compelled counselors to actually hand mm-hmm. over their psychotherapy notes. It's um, And lawyers have said, a friend of mine actually went through this and we were like, well, of course, you don't have to hand over your psychotherapy notes. But uh, the lawyer said, well, yes, it's probable that if we push this, that we could win, but there's a chance we could lose. And it's probably better you just handed them over because um, things could go bad. Uh, well, so side note, well, so I'll come back to that in terms of, I want to know what your opinion is about that. But anyway, there's this notion of just like, well, if you make your psychotherapy notes completely illegible, that's, that's up to you. Cause it's just notes for you. And if something happens, you can just be like, I don't even know what that says. And, and, and for, and they transferred that, which is probably true for psychotherapy notes, because it is just for you. Mm. They transferred that principle to progress notes is, is my guess. Maybe. I don't know where this person got this idea, but it's wrong headed in my I mean for yeah, many It doesn't reasons. make any sense. Yeah. I mean why why would there be notes that uh, wasn't even understood by the clinician itself? Like it, it so you just like <laughs> scribble a bunch of scribbles on a piece of page and that's like a three year old and that's your but anyway, getting back to the question of, of uh, you know, uh, my colleague, uh, a psychologist who had his, uh, he was doing couple therapy and mm. the couple saw him taking psychotherapy notes, which is, you know, common enough anyway for therapists to do. And they were going through some kind of difficult, uh, you know, court situation. And one of the lawyers, if not both, were like, we need those psychotherapy notes. Um, mm-hmm. I think because at least one of the parties thought it would be damning to the other party, you know. Mm-hmm. And the uh, psychologist consulted with some lawyers, and he was like, "Well, of course, the, you know, we're going to say no, you know, and we'll have an official statement that says no." And the lawyer said, "Well, yeah, you'll probably win, but you might lose, and it'll, we can get ahead of this if you if you just actually just hand over your psychotherapy notes." What do you think about that? Well, it's it's never been tested in the courts. It's I, I think it's a really interesting issue. And um, HIPAA says that they're for you, that they're for your use. It says that if the client, as you already said, if the client, the client does have access to their notes by law, unless you believe that they might cause the person harm. Uh, but they do have, generally speaking, they have access to the notes, uh, except for the, and that does not include the psychotherapy notes. So, um I mean, I have suggested to some people that if there's, if sometimes for the subpoena, it'll just say everything. It'll say progress notes, psychotherapy notes, everything. And you can say to the person uh, in keeping with HIPAA, I, I do have psychotherapy notes, but in keeping with HIPAA, I'm not, and the minimum necessary rule, et cetera, I am not including them here. Um, but then they might come back and say that they want them. And then you're in a situation where you can either fight it or not. It has, to date, to my knowledge, it's never been it's never been brought to court. So that question has never been answered. Yeah. And this is the frustration for me. And when I'm teaching people about this, because like there's a rule about a stop sign. You, you, there's a very clear rule. You see a stop sign, you, your car comes to a complete stop before the stop sign. And then you, you look and then you can go. Uh, the speed limit, you know, 55 and 56, you're breaking the law and you can get a ticket. You're not likely, but it is break. You know, there's a clear numerical understanding. You know, it's very clear when it comes to our field. Uh, 
there's all these rules out there and, you know, comments and laws and standards of practice. And then there's this thing of like, well, we don't actually know how the court will rule on this. And until they actually rule on it, we won't know what the real rule is. And that seems to be like a like a reactive uh, rulemaking to, mm. well, now we know what the rule is because <laughs> the Lord on high judge finally told us, you know, what to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course, judges aren't lit it, you know, they're not, they don't write laws. They, they adjudicate laws, right? And they decide, you know, they try to figure things out, but wouldn't it be nice if there was just a law or a rule or something that, so we knew because the first person who gets screwed over in this situation is going to suffer quite a bit. And then all of us will benefit from that suffering, but we could prevent at least that first person from suffering by having some clear guideline. And all of us can actually rest assured at night that there was some, you know, clear guidance. Um, you know, when I see a stop sign, I don't go like, well, I don't know how they're going <laughs> to rule on that, you uh, know, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but I've learned to accept that. Um, and as a pro to that, it just sort of demonstrates that we don't actually get sued very often and we don't actually get um, challenged very often. We're not attacked, so to speak, legally very often. And so thus we don't have that many, uh, you know, opportunities for precedence. Um, mm -hmm. The stop sign thing happens every day. And so there's opportunity for refinement of the understanding. Um, but anyway, I, I'm just venting. Any thoughts on, on that? Um, no, I think I think uh, it's an interesting problem. It, I will say that people should be aware, the counselor should be aware of the fact that even though psychotherapy notes are basically speaking for your purposes, that they could end up being read um, by other people and most importantly or equally importantly by your client. So there's some people who write notes as a form of venting and, you know, psychotherapy notes as a way of venting, dealing with their own, let's say, countertransference. You know, I hate this client. They always challenge my own, they're always challenging me or my boundaries or whatever. So they might express their feelings. But you should be aware that these notes could could show up in a courtroom two feet high, being read by a judge and, and, and a even a jury possibly and lots of people as, and, and your client. So in my opinion, they should always be written with care and with respect and with an awareness of that possibility. Yeah, that's good guidance. Um, we can destroy our psychotherapy notes, correct? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, in general, I can't, I can't really answer that. I mean, it says that the notes are there for you. It hasn't been tried in court yet. We it don't... hasn't been tried in court yet. I mean, in general, with the mental health record, once you put something in a fixed, tangible form, once you put it down in writing, um, it, you can't destroy it. I mean, when it's identified as a note, like yeah. you can amend it, you can correct you can, yeah. it, but you can't just throw it out and replace it. Exactly. Um, unless the time period has passed. And, and that's another myth, going back to these myths, is that there's another myth that um, as soon as the time period has passed, for counselors, it's five years, for, psycho, for uh, psychologists, it's eight years, and then psychologists also have a proviso if it's a child that it has to be either to the age of 22 or uh, eight years, whichever is longer. Um, but there's the myth that people think that once that time period comes, that you should absolutely get rid of the notes. And that's another thing that I think people should put more thought into. Because again, you could be in a situation where you have a client and five years pass, so you get rid of the notes. And then six years later, the client files a complaint against you and you have nothing to support your point, your version of events. Yeah, I have never destroyed any of my private. I've been I've been in private practice for twenty three uh -huh. years, and I still have all of my uh, records going back to those early days. Yeah, uh, because early on, I remember hearing that. But also, I'm just kind of a. I like to. I don't like to just destroy things. Like I have my journal from when I was thirteen years old. Uh -huh. That kind of thing. <laughs> you know, some people will burn it. In the, you know, some ceremony or something. But I, I just like. I think well what's the harm? You know, it doesn't take up that much space in my file cabinet. And uh, uh, what if I need it? Or what if I'm just curious? Or what if a client after 20 years wants to come back to me mm -hmm. and I don't remember them, which would be normal. And I want at least some to jog my memory about them in some way. Um, so yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So you can get rid of them, but should you get rid of them is the thing. And so do you recommend people hold on to their files indefinitely? I, I generally ask them 
let me ask, I'll say, let me ask you this. If there were some kind of a problem, would you rather not have the record and tell people that you got rid of it because five years had passed and it was, the statute said it was okay, or would, or the WAC said it was okay, or would you prefer to be able to have the note and defend yourself? Right. It's up to you. To yeah, me, it's yeah. a no-brainer. Right. I mean, I think especially, another thing that can happen a lot is that uh, people with personality disorders, um, if a client, if a counselor works with someone with personality disorders, those people can ultimately be rather quote unquote high conflict and those might be the that might be a, an example of a person who would um whose case would result in some kind of a either a doh complaint or a lawsuit having nothing to do with you or having to do with you um and those people might be people whose records you'd want to keep yeah i once had a colleague or i have a colleague who once told me that he was an expert a witness regarding ethics of notes and a, I don't know all the details obviously because it was secondhand, but uh, a agency was being investigated or sued or something for bad practices. And they, he was pulled in to evaluate all the record keeping. And wow. one of the things that he found was that there were certain clinicians who had identical notes from week to week. Oh yeah. Um, across different clients. So, oh. um, you know, word for word. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's very problematic. I mean, that suggests that you're copying and pasting unless for some reason you actually use the same words for every client and every client had exactly the same problems and issues that you addressed in exactly the same way. So uh, that suggests that you're copying and pasting and that it's not particularized to the client. So yeah. I think th I think that's actually... That's one of the things that I talk about for people to um, protect themselves is that is that if they were audited, that would be a, I, I believe that would be considered a problem. It would suggest that they're not actually doing individualized practice. Right. Not that the note was inaccurate, but it just suggests that you weren't actually, you know, putting in the effort to actually yeah. uh, accurately reflect what happened. Having said that, there are certain repetitive statements that. I have said over, I mean, you know, how many notes have I taken over 23 years? It's mm -hmm. thousands or something. And uh, I must have repeated myself because mm -hmm. there's only so many options in right. terms of the general statements, you know, uh, discussed ways to reduce symptoms of anxiety or something. You know, how many times have I said that or explored history as it relates to current relationship problems or something, you know, um, there's there's got to be only a small set of uh, the sort of census, particularly if you kind of get in the habit of wording things in a particular way. Mm -hmm. um, not that my notes look identical week to week, but I imagine there would be significant overlap in some of the sentences. And so yeah. what's the thought on that? Well, overlap, yeah. I mean, as you say, we often say the same things for similar situations. I, I thought what you were saying is that it's actually an identical, like a copy-paste. It, it was identical. So, yeah, but but so, I wonder sometimes if if inadvertently some of my notes are either extremely similar or even or even identical at times you know yeah. uh i see a client for seven years it's likely that at least i mean i feel like i'm confident in my ability to navigate this but for the listeners and my mm -hmm. trainees because um, sometimes they try to make every note if they err on a side they err on a side if they want to make every note specifically like in its own voice that reflects exactly what happened in that session. And often what I'm trying to do is bring people more towards a system of uh, similar statements that you use given the scenario of, of that session. Now you might, and I always say, you know, sprinkle in at least one sentence that is, that you can't have repeated in other instances mm, or is well, unlikely to have repeated. Right, so I, I would say go back to the WAC, which says, you know, that the note should be sufficient to, su to support responsible clinical practice for the type that you provide. So uh, theoretical orientation slash therapy that the person provides. So, um, so that's really, if you were on the stand or if you were responding to an audit, it would be up to you. The question becomes, do you feel that you can support this as sufficient to, you know, responsible clinical practice of the type that you provide sufficient to support responsible clinical practice? And uh, if you can, then you can, with honesty, you can look the person in the eye and say that this is what happened. This is what I did. Yes, it's the same as last time, but, you know, often it is the same. Okay. Then that would be something that you can do. I, you know, there more questions would be required. It's not just a kind of cut and paste answer. But um, 
so, but that would be what I would be looking at is that statute or that whack. But another thing you talked about, you referenced disclosure forms. So a disclosure form is uh, required by law and it speaks to what the counselor must disclose to the client so that the client can then make an informed decision about whether the client wishes to be treated. And in, in so doing, the client gives informed consent. But the state has jurisdiction over the counselor, and that's why the state dictates to the counselor that they have to at least have a disclosure form. And then there are some um, pieces of information that the, that the state says the counselor must include. In my opinion, a, now this is another thing. People will come to me and they'll say, do I really have to have a disclosure form? And does it really have to be this long? Well, the answer is yes, you do have to have a disclosure form. As to the length, that's up to you. People seem to associate long, lengthy disclosure forms as being obnoxious or annoying. And short disclosure forms are nice and tidy. Yeah. I would say, okay, but does the short disclosure form protect you? Does it convey the information that you need to have conveyed? So in my judgment- Yeah, just to side note on that, I don't understand that that preference. I, I, I'm like you. Yeah. Uh, my disclosure form is, is quite long. And I've found this in other arenas too with counselors where like at my university, I uh, wanted to develop a really good student handbook that laid out all the expectations similar to a disclosure form in mm -hmm. some ways. And I was getting pushback from people because it was the- this, to make it sufficient, the handbook had to be much larger because it needed to include a lot of things that were just basically rattling around in professors' heads. And I was like, you need to write it down so people can reference it. And I was getting all this pushback of just like, geez, this is long. you know. Um, and I'm like, well, <laughs> it's not wordy. It, it's, it's as long <laughs> as it has to be. Like um, uh, to exclude you know, X, Y, and Z would be, I think, irresponsible. And I think it's similar for a disclosure statement. And yeah. yeah, I just don't understand that sentiment. And back in the day, in the 90s, I remember there were disclosure statements that were fit on one side of one page. Yeah. And that cannot be sufficient because there's just too many things to, to disclose. Uh, yeah, I, I mean... I think that a disclosure form is the single most important risk management tool that you have at your disposal. Hmm. It's your opportunity to be transparent. It's your opportunity to let the client know that you've thought about what they need. It's your opportunity to say what you need for yourself. It's your opportunity to be clear about the type of, of services that you can and can't provide. It's your opportunity to provide information about confidentiality which, and its, its limits, which there are many of, there are many limits to confidentiality. Um, Detailed, I, like it's like you know they, they they're quite specific and, and and there's there's more than people realize, right? Yeah, and and uh, for me, uh, I've often used my disclosure statement. I think in the past because I would develop it with experts and and really make sure it was all buttoned up and as concise as possible, but you know as wordy as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And then at times I would be like, wait, what are my responsibilities? And I would go to my disclosure statement uh -huh. and oh, remind cool. myself as to what I needed to do because uh -huh. it, I knew I had vetted this for public uh, you know, use. Right. And uh, so that's another use, I think, of the disclosure statement for a lot of counselors who aren't experts like you uh, to remind themselves, oh, yeah, that's right, because I developed this five years ago with an right. expert and this reminds me what I'm right. supposed to be doing. Yeah, and it can have your responsibilities and the client's rights and responsibilities but in addition to, so the HIPAA notice of privacy practice, that's pretty much a prescribed form. That, and that's why I think at the end, really the client is the only one who needs to sign or acknowledge. You don't have to sign a HIPAA form. But the disclosure form by law in the state of Washington, both people have to sign and date. If it's not signed and dated by both people, it's not valid. Um, and so the, the state disclosure form is your opportunity to have what the state requires but also to tailor it to your practice. So for instance, if you have a practice that involves touch, like, you know, let's say you do um, um, pain management and part of what you do for that pain management is you teach people to breathe deeply and you might need to point out how to breathe. You know, most people don't even know, how, don't know how to breathe deeply. They don't know anything about the diaphragm. And so uh, you might want to, the impulse might be to touch them in the lower back to show how deeply they can breathe. Um, that touch is a very um, charged issue. A lot of people, particularly if there's been sexual abuse, but under any circumstances, people might feel um, molested if you've only just touched them. 
Um, I might in general recommend not to touch people, you know, for the purpose I just described, you could use a pencil to put toward the person so that they can feel where to breathe. Uh, but anyway, the point being that if that's something you do, then you put it in your disclosure form. You say, this is one of the things that I do in order to promote pain management skills. And um, if this isn't okay, please tell me. It's your responsibility to let me know in writing. I'm absolutely happy to know that. Um, there are also things about legal services. People will say, I don't, I don't go to court. But what if you do have to go to court? What if you're subpoenaed to go to court? I think it's advisable to say, if you want to, you can say in general, I don't go to court. But if I have to, here's how much I charge. Because sometimes you might need to pay, you may, might need to charge money for um, preparation, you know, or uh, writing, some, writing a letter. It's not part of the actual clinical service in session, but you spend your time doing it and you might want to be paid. So, but if you don't put it in your disclosure form, the person might feel blindsided that now all of a sudden they've got an extra bill of $500 that they weren't expecting to have to spend. So, um, so all the secrets is another one, particularly if you're working with couples, how you deal with secrets. Um, there, if you, some people take walks with their clients and what might happen there, or sometimes people have a pet in the room or they allow their client to bring in a pet. There are all sorts of things that can be addressed easily enough, dual relationships, romantic relationships, financial relationships. Um, it's easy enough at the start to say, I do not engage in dual roles and I'm not going to have a personal relationship. We're not going to go to the movies. I mean, you don't have to put those words in, but to have that discussion at the, at first, because later on, if it comes up, it can be, it can be a difficult subject to address. And, um, but if you have it in the, in the disclosure form, it's all there and you can easily say, I don't know if you remember, but we discussed this already risks or benefits of therapy, no guarantees. These are all things that are not dictated by the law, but I believe could be well advised to, to include. Right. Not only is it helpful for people to be informed, as you're saying, and it's also therapeutic, I think, to say, look, I treat all my clients this way. And here's proof that I treat all my clients this way. It's in the disclosure form. Right. This isn't personal to you. Right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not refusing your friendship because I don't like you. It's it's, it's in my disclosure statement. I, I don't do this for anyone. Right. I think that helps to, uh, you know, especially if someone has issues with boundaries and they probably have some traumas around rejection and that sort of thing. And so you, you want to do all you can. Right. Um, do you like as much as I do hearing about cases where people get sued? <laughs> uh well, I mean, my heart goes out to them, and I know it's difficult. I, but they're frequently so <laughs> egregiously. Uh, the behavior is just so bad, you know. The, the comedy of errors that the that these people do. When I review these, you know, my insurance company will send me cases. Mm. I think as a way of educating us about what not to do, of successful uh, cases that have been, you know, gone to court for civil cases or licensure mm. and. And I actually, I'll read them on the podcast and, and um, you know, as a cautionary tale, as a tale for me to learn from. But also, I don't know, there's just something, it's like a, like a Law and Order episode or something. It, it just, it, there's just, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Do you get any pleasure? Well, I do read them. Yeah, I, I, you know, I get notifications from the DOH and they'll say what, um, if there's been an action taken and I will look up the case and read How do you it. look up the case? Uh, you go on the DOH website and it'll say healthcare provider, search for healthcare provider. And if you know the person's name, which will have been in the announcement, uh, you can see exactly what happened. I mean, it's, well, you, it's not the full account. If mm -hmm. you want the full account, you can go to PDRC, the public records division and at the DOH and you can request it, but that can take, I mean, anybody can request it, but that can take months, but you can get it. Is that, does that cost money? It. Yeah. You might have to pay for it. It's like uh, 10 cents a page, I think. Okay. Yeah. How do so, I get on that email uh, for the for the DOH announcements? Um, I don't know. I sort of t stumbled upon it, but you basically go to the DOH and there's some, at some point you can come up with something. I can send you. Yeah, you please. To, uh, yeah, I'll send I, I, it to you. Like I said, I, I, there's something about it. Like, again, I feel bad for them too. But at the same time, these cases often involve behavior that to me, I think they should have known better, or at least they should have intuited, they should have consulted with someone well, see, at, at some yeah. point, and see, they never do. And that's the thing I try to Im impress upon people when I, I do presentations, risk management presentations on record keeping or dual roles or what to do if you get a subpoena and um, DOH complaints. So I, I do these talks and I tell people if there's one thing that you come away with 
It's just to get a sense of what might be a legal issue and that if something might be a legal issue, they should pick up the phone and call. Right. And so, I mean, I do a free consultation. I'm happy to speak to people. Um, How do I people want, contact you? Uh, they can either email me at fs at com, or they can call me at 425-891-3411. I'm happy to receive calls. Great. So I'll ask you for, uh, we'll put that at the end if you didn't get that down. So we'll, we'll get that a repeat later on. Uh, that's a wonderful service that you're offering. I think so. And I, wh- the reason I do it is because I believe that a person should have a lawyer before they need a lawyer. Mm. So, I mean, if you actually need a lawyer, if you get a DOH complaint, most one thing you might do, which is reasonable, is to call your insurance company and see if they have somebody to suggest. And they might, ha- I mean, I... Or your professional organization. Your professional organization, yeah. And um, I, I think it's, I know it's rare just in the state to have somebody who is both a lawyer and who understands what clinical practice is all about. Right. Um, for, for me, having had experience as a therapist and then a psychiatric researcher at two major hospital, two major medical schools, and I've worked with perpetrators of domestic violence as well as targets or victims of domestic violence, um, I have been a, a reunification counselor, which was, that's a whole other story, but I, was a re- I performed that service. I um, have been a family law attorney and now I do this work. So I think... This work meaning consult, legal... Uh, work. I work with people. I represent counselors or li- DOH licensees who have complaints from the Department of Health. Oh. That's the main focus of what I do. Mm-hmm. I also help people set up, in order to hopefully risk manage, I help people set up their documentation uh, for practice so that their um, their disclosure forms are not only adequate, but that they really do protect, you know, they really do communicate what the practice is going to be like. I do ethics consultations. I uh, help people with, if I represent them or um, help prepare them if they have to do depositions or I give advice, if they have subpoenas, if they have to testify in court, it's really important to help them understand the language. As I said before about using the word recommendation, just the use of that word, I have seen being to be very problematic for counselors because it suggests that they are acting in a forensic role. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't even know that, uh, but it makes total sense to me. Yeah. Um, I, I did, I am trained as a forensic psychologist, but I haven't done the work. So I just have like mm. the book knowledge of it <laughs> and some mild, mild experience with assessing. But uh, so this is all kind of coming back to me. <laughs> yeah. It's not rocket science. You know, it's not, it's not impossible to learn. It's just, you need to know to do it. But, so, but where? So, so here's the thing um, that I want your opinion on. I often hear about people going to ethics courses at various universities, um, including my own, I'm just going to say this, where people will emerge from what I understand to be misinformation. Yeah. And what I will say is, um, well, I, I used to be program director of, of my, uh, of the couple and family therapy program at Antioch University, Seattle. And I know how the th- the way this works. It's like you're scrambling for an ethics teacher and, and you just tap someone who's willing to do it, who you think probably mm-hmm. is professional enough to do enough research on it. But you're not sure because you're not an ethics expert necessarily as a program director. And so you can't gauge if this other, this other professor knows more than you do about ethics. So you're like, well, they must know a lot. But the they're not guaranteed to know enough to actually be a, a, you know, a good source of information. And the thing that I tell people is that in, in order to really know if what you're being taught is correct or what you're saying is correct is if you actually have contact with where the decisions are being made, which is in courts and, and, uh, you know, with the state administration people, Mm -hmm. those are the people that, are, uh, you know, regardless of what th- thoughts we have about what's right and wrong, they're the people who actually make the choice, regardless of our own opinion about it. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. the closer you are in contact with those, uh, you know, institutions, the more accurate your advice is going to be, because you're going to actually see the way that it is. And the further you get away from that, the more likelihood your information is going to drift away from reality and more towards just like your own rumor or your own hopes of the way things should be or something. And a lot of these ethics teachers don't necessarily uh, have experience like you where you're, they're actually in those uh, decision-making, uh, you know, 
rooms and seeing the way that the state and these other people make these decisions. Um, and that's why you see this, these, these bad, you know, I, you know, this is just me, but I, my suspicion is 90% of ethics teachers are actually not close enough in contact with what you are in contact mm. with. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know about what most universities are doing with ethics. I, I do know that a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to teach people, they did not learn in school. Right. So, which is to me surprising because it's easy and as i say it's easy enough to teach you just have to know to do it and for instance i've heard some people come away from converse, from ethics courses saying that they learned if they get a subpoena to ignore it right which is terrible right i mean if you get a subpoena i was taught that and were. then later was learned that that wasn't true yeah no. and uh because i have someone like you i have a family therapist slash attorney who is a friend of mine, um, a colleague at Antioch, actually, who doesn't teach at Antioch anymore. And I don't even know if he ever taught ethics, ironically. Um, he taught a lot of family therapy courses. But anyway, whenever I would have questions, I would ask him and he'd be like, well, you know, and, and the way he would talk, the um, way he would talk about the way uh, judges and courts and the state actually uh, adjudicates these things, I was like, whoa, that sounds interesting. You know, like the subpoena thing. It was like, well... You might be able to get away with it, but if you piss them off to a certain extent, they act, the judge can actually just, you know, do certain, th I don't even know what, but they can actually do things to you that will be unpleasant. So you want to make sure that uh, you actually, tr uh, the, it, the advice I remember hearing was, if you're trying to avoid a subpoena, you want to kind of work with the courts on that. <laughs> not You don't want to just ignore them. You know what I mean? Like if you're trying to, uh, you, you can say certain things, like you can sort of test the ground of like, oh, what are you asking me to do? What's the, what's the expectation here? And and sometimes they'll you can actually get them to realize that you're not actually needed and you're not actually a very, yeah. very helpful, uh, you know, to any side. Um, and that requires a conversation with them, not just blowing them off and ignoring them, which they could consider to be a bother and then dig in their heels and really go after you. You know what and, I mean? And would you say that you might let them know you're not needed? I mean, I think often they have unrealistic expectations of what you can do hmm. as, a, as a therapist, what kind of information you have or what you can provide. So I actually think that's a good point where you can, if you're given permission to speak to the person, to just say, I, I, I don't know what you're looking for, but I probably, you know, under the best of circumstances, the, or under the most disclosive of circumstances, the most you could give are the facts. Just the facts. The person is my client. The person that came here on this date, the person um, canceled on that date. The, the diagnosis was such and such and treatment goals were such and such. That's really about it. You can't draw any conclusions. But um, but the, I think there's a misunderstanding around the subpoena issue. You You should not ever do nothing. However, you may not be giving them what they want but you shouldn't ignore the subpoena. You may not fulfill the subpoena, but you should not, never ignore it. Right. Another area of confusion is that I've seen people come away from ethics, um, ethics talks where they, the counselor says that they have privilege, which they don't. They're, they're in a privileged relationship, but the person who holds the privilege is the, is the client. So it's a weird situation where the counselor owes the duty of confidentiality to the client. But if there were an issue around disclosing it, uh, disclosing the record, it's the client who holds privilege over the record. So if you were to call me up and say, I'm the, let's say if I were the, or let, you're the counselor. So I call you up, I'm the lawyer, I call you up as the counselor and I say, I want your client's record. You would first say to me, I can neither confirm nor deny that I even work with this person. But let's say we get past that point and um, you have the duty of confidentiality to your client. You would want to ask your client if your client, um, if your client intends to assert his or her privilege, because that's when it comes to a, when it comes to a legal issue, it's the client who has power over the record. So you hold the record; you're the custodian of the record, but the client has power over the words on the record. You Isn't that just a fancy way of saying release of inf it's confidential unless there's a release, release of information? Or am I not understanding? Well, it's just in terms of you. Sometimes, I mean, that is true that it's confidential unless there's a, either a written waiver or so the, an implied the, waiver, implicit waiver. So the the waiver is the waiving of the privilege, or is that a separate yes, thing? Yes, they waive. Yes, they waive their privilege. Okay. 
but but it's where the, the or they well anyway but i've seen counselors come away thinking that they hold privilege and they don't they need to understand the the limitations meaning of that. that if the client says please hand over your record the therapist thinks they don't have to the ther- no somebody if somebody comes to the therapist and says we want the record the therapist thinks that it's up to them to say yes or no right and it's actually up to the therapist to say to speak to the client and find out what's going on okay um, in the case of a mental health, a subpoena for mental health record, there is a statute that rules that, and um, it's a whole process. They have to get a letter, a two-week notice letter, and then if, which gives the client time to try to get a protective order over the record, and if the client either tries to get a protective order and fails to get a protective order, or if the client simply doesn't try to get a protective order, then after that period, the counselor will have to turn over the record. Right. And again, for those of you listening, you don't have to remember this. Right. You just have to remember this is a situation you need legal counsel exactly. uh, to navigate. Right. Exactly. Right. See, that's my point. If somebody walks away from here and they're thinking, oh my gosh, what was that? Like, I don't want to have to bother with the statutes and that's too complicated for me. That's fine because really the main point is to know this might be a legal issue. I'm going to call Fran or I'm going to call a lawyer. I want to talk to somebody about this because if you don't, if you ignore it, you could end up in hot water. But if you take care of it, it might be perfectly simple and it's easy to do. You okay. just want to make a call. So uh, what are the common DOH complaints that you deal with? A very common DOH complaint is a dual role, creation of a dual role. And that can often be a sexual dual role where a client, where a therapist becomes involved with a client or a former client. More commonly, it's a former client, but it can be a current client. Um, also, there can be ish- problems around, um, they often come up around children, actually, custody issues. So the issue itself is one of scope of practice, but it'll come up around working with somebody who wants you to uh, make a recommendation as to custody, or if you're working with a child, the parents kind of fight over the child, and one of, or a parent might, try to get you to um, file a CPS report. And if you do that, then the other parent will become enraged. So, But that's not, can't be founded, right? I mean, if we hear something, we got to report it, right? If you hear something that you have a reasonable cause to believe is, you know, is problematic, that yeah. a child or elderly person or a dependent person has been abused, you must report it. Yeah. But Um, But, you know, the other person might, the person who's being accused or allegedly harmed somebody, they might feel that you were ill-advised in doing it. They might feel that you didn't have a reasonable cause to believe, that it's just another parent who's trying to get back at me and you listen to them. So what's the distinction there for us? Well, see, in the end, it might be dismissed. But the point is, is that these are the things that enrage people that cause them to file complaints. Right, right, right. So, and then, you know, even if it's dismissed, as you're well aware, it's horrifying for people. It's humiliating. It's, it's aggravating. It's, if you don't have the right insurance, it's very expensive. And how expensive? um, Well, I mean, I shouldn't say very, I mean, it can be thousands of dollars. Like 20,000? Could be. For lawyers? Yeah. And experts? I mean, yeah. I mean, if it goes to a hearing, it'll be much more. Right. But just to sort of take care of it all, it could be ten thousand dollars. It could be t- if it's really easy, it could be less. But even just to squash a ridiculous, exactly. enraged ex husband yep. who and is can, yep. you know has something wrong with him, and he's just and you it know. can take over a year. So yeah. I mean, these things can take a long time. I have one case that hasn't even we got a, the the first letter that telling the person that a, fi- a complaint had been filed over a year ago and it hasn't even gone into the investigation yet. Wow. So, but what that means is that now going into a year, if you have to re-credential with your insurance companies or you need to re-up your own insurance for your own liability insurance, you now have to report that you're being investigated. Whereas if it, if it could just take a couple of months, then at least you get that heartache off of your the, chest. And this is something that, because I've... Not often as you, I've just, a, you know, I don't know, a dozen cases or something where I've been called as a expert or consulted or something on these along these lines. And I've seen enough of them where it, they don't freak me out very much. I, I, I kind of see, well, you know, your number came up and someone decided to drag you through this process. And, you know, now it's time to go through the process. And yes, there are elements of this that are going to be inconvenient. But 
the the biggest consequence to the counselors is the emotional side of just the humiliation that you mentioned and just the terror and the the deep sense of shame that I think all therapists like have just below the surface of like, I'm going to be called out as a fraud and you know, everyone will figure out like how stupid I am as a, as a clinician. And uh, do you ever try to help people with that uh, emotional process? Well, uh, yes. I mean, I try to help people come through this process with their heads held high, but and during though, of just like, okay, we're about to head into this for a year. Um, you're probably going to feel a lot of shame. Uh, it's a lot of it is probably not justified in terms of, you know, the, the deep shame and stress that you're going to feel. It's quite normal for these kinds of things to happen. They don't happen to everyone, but, you know, try to take it easy on yourself and, you know, worst case scenario, uh, you'll probably have to, uh, go into probation and you have to take some extra classes. You know, I don't know if you can advise on that level of predictions and everything, but I don't, do you ever try to, cause that's what I've tried to do when people have come to me. I've been like, because they're the gestalt of their, you know, uh, approach to me and communication to me is their desperation and despair and they're, you know, they're not sleeping at night and they're crying and they, they're like, maybe even suicidal on some level just mm-hmm. because of how, how earth shattering this can be to people. But to someone like you who just sees this as a routine thing, it's just like, well, you know, sometimes it's justified and, you know, there should be some tears involved. But, you know, as you're saying, you just have an angry father who is waging a complaint because um, you just did your duty, you know, um, the that counselor shouldn't have to cry themselves to sleep every night, right? I mean, do you ever try to help them with that? Well, my my function is legal, and I always reiterate that I'm not their therapist, but I feel that that doesn't keep me from from helping them legally in a kind way and in an empathic way. So I do let them know. I don't necessarily say that I expect that they're going to feel shame, um, but I do... Under, I do tell them that I understand that this is mortifying and can, can feel humiliating. I let them use the words and then I can reflect them back. Um, but, um, but I certainly let them know that I'm there to help them get through it, not only legally, but also to, um, to reflect back to them that this may not be their fault. Now, sometimes, sometimes there are fairly egregious things that can occur. And um, I might talk to them about um, what precipitated it, because sometimes that helps in their narrative as they respond to it. And I often find that it's really important to have people tell their story. First of all, because people I find in general, people feel the need to be heard. But also, if a person were to try to answer, respond to this thing on their own, often people will do a whole mea culpa. Oh my God, what was I thinking? Which, you know, I did something wrong when they didn't. And sometimes they might um, give more of a story than they really need to. They get into other really psychotherapy issues that are not legal issues and that can actually put them at risk if they say too much, more than is needed. I try to get them to just pay attention to the question, answer the question, and then stop talking. So that's... So one of the situations that I'm dealing with on a daily basis with my supervisees, and I guess in my own practice, is that as a family therapist, um, I am a couple and family therapist, uh, we treat couples and families and individuals and our industry and our uh, reimbursement structure and insurance structure is all based on one person. You know, when your son has a broken arm and you bring him into the hospital, they don't open a file for the whole family. They just open a file for the, for the boy with the broken arm. And that's the medical model that we, you know, adopt in our, in our uh, psychotherapy field, which is an ill-advised in, in many situations, but doesn't really graft onto the way that family therapists operate. We treat the family system. And although one person might have quote unquote, a lot of symptoms, we recognize that uh, often it's, it's a, the, the symptoms are a result of the way the system is operating. A very simple example is uh, you have parents who are very stressed out and are having a lot of marital stress and a teenager who has depression. Uh, and you, instead of just singling out the teenager with depression, you think, well, this whole family needs to uh, look at, you know, how their, uh, their stress level in general, how they're treating each other, the love, the attachment, um, how stressed this kid is about the parents uh, relationship, that kind of thing. Anyway, so when um, my supervisees are at agencies and they're um, seeing, you know, the te- that teenager comes in to see them and then they say, okay, parents, come on into the office, you know, let's talk about this. 
the thing I always say is before you treat the parents, you have to get con informed consent. You can't just like pull them into the office and start treating them. So you have to do the whole gamut that you did with a teenager in terms of you're a client, here's my approach, here's confidentiality. Do you, do you agree to a family therapy treatment plan? Um, all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, my question to you is, because I've actually seen cases where counselors will get um, slammed for not navigating this uh, scenario or correctly um, so that a client will not be informed that they're a client, you know, a parent won't realize they're a client, and then later down the line something, you know, weird happens, and then they want to wage a complaint, and they, the lawyer says, well, were you ever given informed consent? And I don't know, did you, did you see cases like this ever? Well, I've read about cases like this um, because I read these things, and uh, to to and I've had clients who had prior cases like this. Uh, family couples and family work is incredibly, as you're well aware, is incredibly complicated because of the systems involved, and the the um, the um, LMFT code of ethics says that when, as opposed to all the other codes of ethics, actually articulates that when they get con informed consent. They get informed cons before they'll release a record. They get informed. Con they get the consent of every person capable of giving consent. They won't otherwise release the record. So that would include a third in this state. That would include a thirteen-year-old child, which is good. Um, you you cross over onto so many issues. And again, as I said earlier, you have to know who's your client, what your role is, and what the goals are. So. That's really kind of what that what you're talking about is knowing who's the client, and that's also that they need to know that they're clients. Mm -hmm. If they're not clients, that they're collaterals, then their hold hold on privilege, which we just discussed, is affected, and it affects whose whose signature you need, for instance, to release information. Um, if you start with one client, let's say that family brings the, the the child who's depressed, and the child is your named client. And then you bring in other people, you risk the child feeling that he's, he or she is losing his therapist to the family. And then also, you, but also you have the insurance issues. You know, if the, depending on who's the identified patient or the identified client, the insurance is expecting the therapy to be geared toward that person. Right. So if you bring in the family um, in order to, to enhance the treatment for that one person, then that's fine. But if you then end up in a situation where you're in fact doing family therapy, which is a perfectly wonderful service to provide, but it may not be what the insurance is covering. Right. So you, and I've seen, I've seen um, threads where counselors are saying, I don't care what the insurance says. My duty is to my client. And even though it's one person in a couple who's using their insurance that, and they're really doing couples therapy, they're billing it incorrect. They're billing it in a way that, that is a code that's suggesting that they're treating the individual, not the couple, and they could, you know, that could be fraudulent activity. So, so there's the there's the insurance issue as well as the clinical issue in what you're describing. Yeah, but I have seen situations, DOH cases, where it started out, for instance, with one child in the family, and they brought in other people, and the child felt that her, she lost her therapist, and that the DOH said that that mm -hmm. was doing harm because not only did that child lose her therapist because she felt she lost her therapist, but it affected her, it could affect her her attitude toward therapy going forward. Interesting. And that was a harm that the DOH identified. So the family therapist didn't get um, enough informed consent from the client prior to inviting the other members into, That's the, right. into the room and didn't document it. That's right. Yeah, just sort of against any, or without any conversation, essentially just pulled in the parents. Yeah. 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 And and the the therapist might have felt that it had good clinical purpose to it to pull in the parents. I mean, right. generally it does in a situation like that. But um, but it has to be done with consent. Right. And the distinction here is that it started as individual therapy. If it started as family, if you know session one, it's it's everyone. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, and you're, you give informed consent to everyone from minute one, and, and you're like, I'm a family therapist, this is family therapy, uh, do, does everyone consent to that model? Then that wouldn't be as much of a concern because you never framed it as, and it was never, uh, at least it didn't ever looked like individual therapy for the teenager. Right, and then the question becomes whether the insurance pays for that because usually insurances don't. 
Yeah. I mean, it, and, and that's also complicated because you can call up an insurance company and speak to the representative on the phone and they'll look at the code and it'll, it sometimes says something about family. And so then they'll say, yes, this is covered. When right. in fact, on the deeper level, when it gets higher up in the insurance, it's not covered. Well, so you really need to make sure that it's covered. Yeah. I mean, someone who's done this, you know, a fair amount, I, but it's never really been tested, I guess. But the the practice that I do and that I tell people to do is there's a code that, because essentially, because insurance company, like you said, it, it's, it's geared towards the treatment of one person for a set of diagnoses. And what you do is that, yeah, you don't send, my client is the family to the insurance company. You say, my client is this one individual, which is accurate. You're not lying. You're, you're just not mentioning the other clients, you know, I guess. And then, um, you say I'm treating this person with other people present in the room, which is which is reimbursable to to insurance companies, and it's accurate. It's legit. You're not lying. You're just framing it in a way that is in the language that insurance companies. Uh, but are you it. in fact treating this person with other people in the room? Because right. the question becomes: if the treatment is geared toward this one person, and everybody else in the room is there for the benefit of that person's therapy, then that supports what you're saying. Right. But if in fact you're talking, I mean, there could be good reason to talk about, well, maybe the father is depressed or maybe the father has, a, has a, you know, difficulties at work or the mom has difficulties at work or there's another sibling who's failing at school or who's in a relationship there where there's abuse, uh, you know. So, so that can affect the person who, for whatever reason, is the identified client. Right. So the question becomes whether you're actually looking at the parents' problems because they're part of the system but you're looking at them for the parent, for the benefit of the parent or, or sibling, or are you looking at any of those, those other issues which are sort of adjunctive to the identified patient? Yeah, it's, yeah right, absolutely. And your notes should support right. what and you're doing. And your philosophy should, you know, and yeah. the notes should support that. And we don't lie, we're not, and that's the whole thing. It's like, there's a legitimate way to do it that isn't lying, that, you know, you're being, you're not, fraudulent, um, right. but you are um, uh, speaking in the language of, of the insurance company because it's not the way that family therapists speak, right? Um, but it is the way that they operate. And so you can, you just have to word it in a way that, you know, fits the insurance company. Um, similar to couple therapy, um, you, they don't often couple, you know, cover a couple therapy, but they will cover, co cover individual therapy. And right. so if one person is diagnosable and has a medically necessary diagnosis, then um, the insurance company is, you know, has always been perfectly fine with, with my, you know, codes <laughs> of, right. of other people having to be present in, in the room. You right. Know but I mean? it should be what you're saying. It should right. be in the case you're describing, you should be doing the therapy for that one person and the other person in the room is there for the benefit of that one person, right. as opposed to being there for the benefit of the couple. Right. Which, it, which well, but it is a, a, a potato, potato kind of a thing, you know, like, it, like, like, let me give an example. Well, give me two examples. One, okay. one is where I couldn't and won't uh, bill in that way, and one I will. So one person has <laughs> been uh, through, well, okay, I'll give a, I'll change some details, obviously, but there was a couple, a gay couple uh, one of the partners had uh, been cheated on and had um, discovered the, uh, you know, infidelity rather uh, abruptly. And, and it was it, it, and it was a very particular reaction from this person that it was a trauma reaction. They had a spike in distress. They had a lot of symptoms afterwards. And so um, the diagnosis was, I can't remember the exact diagnosis, but it had something to do with trauma. And the treatment uh, of recovering from infidelity was absolutely a, a discussion in with the couple, um, but I absolutely was focused on reducing the trauma symptoms in in the individual and successfully did that. But a lot of the conversation, but all the many of the conversations were with the couple in the room. Would you say that that's a a, le a legitimate uh, uh, case to the insurance company that that was individual therapy with another person in the room? Well, the other person in the room was there entirely for the benefit of the person identified as the client. Uh -huh. So you're not getting into couples issues per se. You're really there for the benefit of the client. 
Yeah, but it is a couple issue because the other person was the one who had cheated on on. So depending on how clear it is, you know, you would just need to be. Hopefully, you'd write a note back to the documentation issue. You know, you'd write a note that um, is sufficient to support the responsible clinical practice of the type that you provide, mm-hmm. theoretical orientation slash therapy that you provide, and, and it's and it's disclosed to the clients and right they and understand it's disclosed. That. And you know, I mean, the worst thing, in my opinion, the worst thing you can do with an insurance company is to try to get over. It's, I mean, just be transparent if it comes up, right. but um, because, because they could do a clawback, you know, what's called a clawback, they could want all their money back right? and they could accuse you of fraud. I right. mean, it's, right. So you don't want that. No, nothing is worth that. Um, and uh, it would really depend on how you see it and how you do it, you know, how you perform that therapy. But again, I would just say whoever is identified as the person whose, whose insurance it is, if it's considered individual therapy, it should be for the benefit of that person, mm-hmm. as opposed to the benefit of the couple, where the couple comes in and talks about their issues as a couple. Mm-hmm. So I can't go by the facts that you're, I mean, I realize you're giving me a general idea, so with a general idea I couldn't necessarily, but right. these are the considerations I would have. Yeah, it's good for me to kind of mull over because uh, it is a question I get a lot of. And what the, the a common uh, rumor, I guess, is that it's, you know, couple and family therapy just isn't covered at all. And so a lot of people just walk away going, well, I guess I can't use insurance. And that's not the case because in, you know, my 23 years, um, I've absolutely used insurance mm-hmm. and, and mulled over this question a lot of just like, well, and at times they do, they'll ask me to justify my treatment plan. And, and I've provided documentation, you know, to that and been able to kind of mull over like, well, am I just making this up or is this legit? And I've, you know, I've come to the conclusion that, um, in the cases that I've uh, designated as such, that it is totally legit. And mm-hmm. I'm not just shoving a round peg into a square hole. Mm-hmm. You know, it, mm-hmm. it is, uh, it, but it is just a different way of describing it. And because um, with my couple and family therapy colleagues, I'm not saying this is individual therapy. You know, I'm not saying um, I'm, because I'm a, you know, even when I'm doing individual therapy, let me put it this way. I have clients who come to me, they're just individual adults. Um, I am treating the, their whole system, you know, uh, even though I don't have contact with those other individuals, I am thinking systemically. And through that one person, I am, you know, trying to affect that whole system so that they can all meet each other's needs and this sort mm-hmm. of thing. And so, uh, so yeah, I was just rambling about that. But it, it is a, a stress for a couple and family therapists, which I find to be just uh, strange because, there's a ton of evidence, empirical evidence, that family therapy does uh, work for a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so why are we excluding, you know, empirically sound treatment plans? Yeah. You know, it's just uh, just because it's inconvenient or something. But anyway, um, so my last question for you, because uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, and um, is so on Facebook. There's a lot of discussions about ethics. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned you see Facebook threads um, and being friends with TIFF, I'm guessing, you know, you have, I don't know what contact you have with all the different, TIFF has a wide variety of experiences <laughs> or something. on Facebook, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, what's something you've seen on Facebook lately that you thought, oh boy. Yeah, I do know some people who are on 40, 50, 60 Facebook sites I've heard. Um, I don't. I, I don't do that. I don't have the bandwidth for it. I think it's a huge responsibility as an attorney to go on to a Facebook page and say, I have the answer because there, you know, there are so many facts that can be involved. So, um, so I don't do that. Yeah, I have a similar feeling. I'm, I browse Reddit all the time and mm-hmm. there are a few subreddits that I follow that have to do with psychotherapy and people will pose questions on there that are from a layman's perspective and and i definitely have an answer to it but i just think uh like to present myself as a professional who actually answers this question adequately and understands even the question adequately would just require like hours of my day right <laughs> and so it it just i just say ah, you know yeah. I, I hope someone else answers that question because i don't have the time well and also first of all you end up going down a rabbit hole because then they have all sorts of other facts secondly if you elicit those facts now you're eliciting facts on a public forum that could be problematic really for a client thirdly anything i say because i'm an attorney people i fear that people will take that to be um legal advice when it wasn't I, I can't give legal advice uh, if it's when I don't have all the facts, and if particularly if I'm not representing somebody, I feel 
it's not my place. Um, and then there was a thing, a last thing that I wanted to say, but uh, it just becomes very, very complicated, and right. I, I don't think it's wise for me to put myself in that position. Yeah, it makes sense, and it's unfortunate, uh, I think, because the average, if not the vast majority, of conversations, uh, you know, among therapists regarding ethics are um, just a string of, of misinformation and, and reinforcing the, the misinformation. Yeah. So Fran, at the end of this episode, is there anything we didn't get to that you feel like you want to make sure we get to? Uh, thanks for asking. Yes, there were when we spoke about note keeping, um, a really nice, concise way to take the note can be that um, the counselor can comment on something and then just say as evidenced by or as reported by. If they want to say a client appears to be depressed, they say as evidenced by. If a client says that um, they have some comment on someone else in their family, you put a quote around it. The, the counselor should not should not assume it to be the truth or factual, and the counselor should not take that on as their own evidence. Um, it should be as evidenced by and as reported by. Meaning that you've seen some people document their progress notes where they say, client was depressed today and that's it. Right. Um, rather than providing evidence that they observed that would, one, bolster their uh, claim that the person was depressed, and also, um, in the case of scrutiny, it wasn't like they just had a, a sense of something. They were actually using clinical observations to make that conclusion. Exactly. When, whenever someone keeps a note, it's really important to, to link it, to link the observations to the diagnosis. This helps if, hopefully nobody will ever be audited, but if they were to be audited, um, they would be, the, the counselor would be able to point precisely to the diagnosis what the symptoms were that led to the diagnosis, and then how those symptoms are reflected throughout the session so that there should be no question about reimbursement. Yeah, I run into this a lot with my trainees. I think part of it is because they're not trained to do this very mm -hmm. well. And it's also kind of a scary thing. It's much easier just to say, yeah, they're depressed, moving on, rather than, oh, crap, I have to justify this. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a matter of training. And uh, the as evidenced by is actually something that I have hammered into my students' mm -hmm. head prior <laughs> to them actually even going to internship. When they uh, do these mock therapy uh, role plays in class, and I will ask them to have a conceptualization of in, in various, not only diagnosis, but other assessment um, uh, angles. And I will always hammer on them if they don't provide evidence. If mm -hmm. if there's well, this you know this client clearly has a problem, has a complex with their mother or something like that, and I say, as evidenced by, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the people that do that, they get into that rhythm of like, okay, I just made a claim, and now I have to say as evidenced by. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes it so much more convincing, one, and two, just reflects that you are using competent uh, methods of assessment. You're not just like willy-nilly throwing stuff out there, with, which honestly, no offense to the clinicians, but I see clinicians doing this sometimes, you know. Uh, experienced people will just be like, well, clearly the person has borderline personality disorder or something, mm -hmm. and I'll be like, I'll be like, okay, you know, what's what's the evidence? I'm, I'm listening. Right. And they'll be like, well, you know, they just have that kind of vibe. And I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. And and I think one of the reasons for that can be that as a group, um, therapists are people who are, generally speaking, highly intuitive and picking up on a lot of unspoken signals and body language, things like that. So they've learned throughout their lives to draw certain conclusions, you know, kind of as a protect protective and adaptive mechanism. But in this context, you're right, in this context, it's really important to be able to give the evidence and further, I mean, for good practice, but further, if they should be audited, or if the if they're in a find themselves in a courtroom with their notes being scrutinized, you have to be able to do responsible clinical practice and give the evidence for what you say. Yeah, absolutely. And again, just to hammer on this a little bit more is I blame education training programs, and I blame supervisors. Mm. Uh, when we look at the medical field, from what I understand from watching TV shows, they <laughs> will have rounds and they will uh. walk around with the with the resident and there'll be the student essentially and the uh, more superior uh, physician will be like, okay, what do we see? Okay, let's go through our 
our assessment procedure. Okay, I see vomiting, I see red eyes, I you know, whatever it is. And okay, what's the conclusion? You know, there's a process of observation, mm-hmm. checking with the material, the research literature, or the diagnostic manuals, and then a conclusion, um, and then a treatment that follows that 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 label. Um, but in in our field, it's a lot of just like, well, you know, they have this. Moving on, you know, mm-hmm. instead of going through the steps and. When, you, when I take my trainees through the steps, they get better at it. Um, yeah. And proper diagnosis does call for those things. I mean, right. each diagnosis has various symptoms and criteria that are required. And even going further, it's not just about whether the, whether the condition meets the criteria for the diagnosis itself, but then to do a differential diagnosis right. where you have to consider, okay, it could be this, but what about something else? Are there other medical conditions or are there other psychiatric conditions that would also meet those criteria. So a good diagnosis is a lengthy process. It's not just an intuitive process. Right. But, you know, an intuitive process can help, but you ha- it has to be bolstered by the evidence. Right. So were there other things that we didn't get to? In the- yes. Um, also, I wanted to say that we talked about how sometimes uh, counselors might be asked to provide a letter or some kind of commentary about whether a client would be a better parent or how they might see the client in a custody battle. I, Generally speaking, it's really best not to find yourself in the middle of that and, if anything, to only be factually based. But I just want to say that one way that a statement can be made, rather than saying, I, th- I think my client is a good parent, which you have no basis to say that on, because even if the client brought the child into the room. You're only seeing them under very limited conditions. Uh, But you could say, I've seen nothing inconsistent with good parenting. Or you could say, everything I've seen is consistent with what I understand to be good parenting and to to say what that is. But that's not a statement as to whether the person is a good parent. It's just that you haven't seen any flagrant behaviors that would defy that conclusion. So if a treating therapist, family therapist, treating a say, a divorcing mother and two kids were to come to therapy with three, you know, the two kids and the mom in therapy and the therapist is treating. And the mom asks, hey, I'm going to court and there's a custody at question and I would like you to provide a statement that um, about my parenting, that I'm a good parent. That to say this person is a good parent um, and particularly to say, by you know, I believe the husband to be a terrible parent. Obviously, you know that those are out of the scope because one, you never treated, you never assessed the father directly, and also you're biased because you're you're treating the family. Um, but you can you can say a report that says something to the effect of, um, I have seen nothing that is outside. What was your phrasing again? Well, nothing inconsistent. Nothing inconsistent with uh, good parenting. Well, but first, I, that's under the, the most extreme of circumstances, if you're really forced to say something, I, which, you know, generally speaking, I think it's important not to be in that position, mm. because you're going, you, you, you're teetering on a dual role, you're right. teetering on going into that forensic piece. Um, so you would be saying the facts I've seen, I've, I've seen nothing inconsistent or nothing or everything consistent with, right. but really the best practice is to stay out of it right. because what you always are risking is the therapeutic alliance and you're risking, you, you really can't win. I mean, a therapist in a forensic setting, I would dare say can't win because if nothing else, you're putting the therapeutic alliance on, on the table, the role of your clients say your clients uh, attorney who's supposedly on your client's side not yours necessarily but on your client side the role of that person is going to be to bolster the client but there's going to be a cr- usually a cross examination and the role of that person will be to impeach you or to make you look bad and to um to to basically take your testimony and turn it inside out so um in favor of their their client's needs. So you, my feeling is that you really can't win. And the best thing you can do is to stay out of it and to explain to your client that it won't serve you to do that. If the language, I'm just saying that you, since you can't say the person's a good parent and you can't say the person's a bad parent, and if they want something to that effect, it's, you're not the one, you're not the one to give that. They need to hire 
an evaluator. They need to hire a parenting evaluator or have a psychological evaluation or something like that. Um, but the most innocuous thing you might be able to say would be that the, I've seen nothing consistent with bad parenting or I've seen nothing inconsistent with good parenting. Under what circumstances would you be compelled to even provide a statement? I would doubt that you would ever be compelled. I think the real uh, strength is in learning how to evade that yeah. that position. Yeah. The thing I tell my supervisees are two things. One, you tell them that your supervisor won't allow you to do it because, because I won't. Yeah. Just blame me. And mm -hmm. two, it's unethical to provide that because of the dual role. Right. And if they need further explanation, I can provide them with material that actually explicitly states that. Right. And I had one client who um, who was on the stand at a, at a hearing, and she was asked a question that was outside of her scope. And I, I had told her to simply say, that's outside of my scope of practice. And um, she then... The, but the the attorney kept pushing and kept pushing, and I told her to turn to the judge and say, Your Honor, I'm here as a fact witness. I'm being asked an expert witness question, Do you, which is out of my scope of practice. Do you order me to answer this question? Uh. So put it in the lap of the judge. If the judge had ordered her, she might have answered it, but I would still maintain that she had no opinion in the in the forensic sense. She had no expert opinion because she was a fact witness. In that case, when she did that, the judge said what she said. The judge just agreed that, and and did not order her to answer the question, and that was hmm. taken care of. So are there any other things? Yeah. So then we've got the question of the psychotherapy notes, mm. which you asked about. So psychotherapy notes are explained by HIPAA as um, notes that are under the domain of the counselor, him or herself. Um, there are, it, it's for the use of the counselor, him or herself. But there are some criteria that must be observed. The main one is that the psychotherapy notes, to be psychotherapy notes, must be kept separate from the rest of the medical record. Now, in the old days, when it, people were using file cabinets, uh, that meant that it should be in a separate file. With it. it could be within the file cabinet, but a separate file. Now, people are very concerned because, um, of course, we have electronic files, but it should still be in a, some sort of a separate file, somehow separated. Even having said that, however, there are certain criteria that must be met in order to maintain, in order to maintain the protections of a psychotherapy note. And one of those... One of those criteria is that it can, the psychotherapy notes should not include a diagnosis or include a summary of symptoms for the diagnosis. So before, when you asked about um, putting in a psychotherapy note, whether maybe there's a question of sexual abuse, um, that might be a, stated as a hypothesis, but if you begin to give the symptoms that make you think that, you border on whether or not that can be maintained as a psychotherapy note. Because the courts or the law or the privilege or maybe you know uh, has this notion or um, standard that uh, everything that relates to the diagnosis and assessment is up for grabs when it comes for pulling the file? I don't know if I'd put it that way. I, the way it states it in HIPAA, I'm reading from it, it says psychotherapy notes exclude medication prescription and monitoring, counseling session start and stop times, the modalities and frequencies of treatment furnished, results of clinical tests, and any summary of the following items, diagnosis, functional status, the treatment plan, symptoms, prognosis, and progress to date. So, so basically everything that's supposed to be in the in the public file, the, f the file available to the client and anyone who pulls it, uh, should not I mean, the way I would interpret that, because I've read that in the past, mm -hmm. I interpreted that as saying, look, when you have diagnostic information, don't put it in the psychotherapy notes, put it in the file, but you can also have it in the psychotherapy notes. Well, it says here, psychotherapy notes exclude. Exclude. So, but but it's, that seems to miss the point. I mean, of course, that's what it says, and I'm not arguing you're a better expert on, it, on evaluating that wording, but to me... When I read that years ago, I was like, it's saying, look, when you write this stuff down, if it's if it's in one place, it should not be in the psychotherapy notes. It's not that's not the place for it. It needs to be in the file available to the client because they need that information for medications and all that, you know, that's relevant information. But if also in your psychotherapy notes you comment on it, you know, obviously you're not gonna have uh, 
the systematic way necessarily the way you have in your progress notes that are available to the client and other physicians. But if you have comment on the details, like elaboration, like, you know, someone has PTSD, for example, and in your, uh, the progress note, the file, the treatment plan you have, and the assessment you have that's available to the client, you have um, PTSD, here are the symptoms as evidenced by blah, blah, blah. And then in your psychotherapy notes, you have like, like a really common example for, for my psychotherapy notes is I'm talking with a client about, because I'm doing, you know, prolonged exposure therapy with them, and the diagnosis is PT, PTSD. And in my psychotherapy notes, as they start working on their trauma narrative, I write down every detail of the sexual assault that they went through, because that's part of the, the part of the model. They would not like those details to be in the progress notes if the insurance company were to pull it or if some legal thing happened. They don't want any of that story in there. Now, I, I guess I could say uh, you write it down and you take it home and it's not in my psychotherapy notes, but it's much easier if it's in my office and I can look at it and have it in my own language and this kind of thing. Um, so are you saying that according to HIPAA, uh, and if the file was pulled and they knew about the psychotherapy notes that they could also pull those those psycho, those psychotherapy notes? Well, so again, so this is an example of how I said at the beginning that I'm not giving legal advice and that, you know, and that everything is fact specific. So I would need to know, I would want to sit down with you. I would want to read the note and, and really look at that. I think in general, it's believed, although I've never seen it stated as such, it's believed that the psychotherapy note comes out of the kind of Freudian analytic tradition, where a counselor or an analyst might be really looking very strongly at their own countertransference and discussing transference and countertransference, which these days are not necessarily used for the notes that go to insurance companies. Insurance companies are really interested in the DSM or the ICD and the diagnosis and the symptoms that both render the diagnosis and flow from it. So. I'm thinking more if, for instance, if you have a client and you're thinking, wow, this client really pushes my buttons. You know, I find myself really not liking talking to this client. That would be something that would, that could go into a psychotherapy note that could help you in your work with that client because you'd be self-examining. You might take it to your own supervisor and discuss it, but it's not appropriate or needed for the insurance record. Uh, but what you're pointing out is the complexity of the this issue of record keeping and uh, documentation and how that should work. And I think it's it's still a kind of living, living thing that we all have to grapple with. And that's why we do uh, ethics consultations. That's why you know we didn't we didn't talk about this, but you were asking earlier about um, do I enjoy looking at cases and and seeing. <laughs> and one of the things that I've been struck by. You'd think after a certain amount of time, you'd see the same story happen again. And I've never seen the same story happen. If it might be the same mm, fact pattern on some broad level, you know, somebody, if, if, a, if a counselor has sex with a client or with a former client, or if there's a scope of practice or a family law, or a, uh, sorry, a family uh, counseling issue, but it's never quite the same dynamic. And so that's why everything really needs to be considered on its own, unto itself, sui generis. Well, uh, so you go by Fran? Fran and Francis. Okay. So Fran slash Francis, <laughs> uh, thanks for coming to the podcast. Very valuable to me, I'll just say that, and I know <laughs> to the listeners, because uh, like we've been saying, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and even ethics instructors, continuing ed and in graduate school, aren't as close to the source or even near the to the source as you are and have a lot of misinformation and are spreading that misinformation. Mm. And uh, it's really a disservice uh, to us as a profession and, and to individuals. And so thanks for coming on the podcast. Again, give us your contact information. So um, francisshopick.com, F-R-A-N-C-E-S-S-C-H-O-P-I-C-K.com. I can be emailed at fs, that's f as in Francis and s as in Chopik, fs at com, or call me at 425-891-3411. And you provide free, free consultation, consultation up to about half an hour. And, um, and you can get questions answered and 
begin to decide if you feel comfortable speaking and if there's something else I can help you with, I'd be happy to. Yeah, very important. Yeah. Well, thanks, Fran, for coming on the podcast. Uh, thank maybe you for we'll, me. Maybe we'll have you back on to talk about other kinds of things. <laughs> okay, thank you. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really do. Mm-hmm.